think science really should be the study of God's majesty, of his awesomeness. That's what we're doing with science. We're trying to find out more about God's creation. What this verse is saying is you look around and it has the stamp of an incredible creator, designer, artist all over it. We are lovingly made by a God who, who wants a relationship with us. That's why Christianity is so important to me, because it is everything. Without it, we have literally nothing. So I know, I know, deep down, however you've suppressed it, deep down, you have a sense that God is. You know that God is. What's more reasonable to believe? That an eternal God made the world or that it made itself? That's what a banner does. It announces something with pride about somebody. Listen to this. His banner over you is love. Everybody. Good morning. Hi. Welcome to Bagden Community Church. Um, I just said, I, I think today might be the first day of summer, or we're coming up to. Hooray. <laughs> okay. Uh, a few notices um, before we get started today. A couple of family notices. So, first of all, congratulations to Carla and Leon, who had their third baby on Friday, Rowan. So, congratulations, Carla and Leon, probably watching somewhere. Um, and let's just continue to pray for them as a family. I think it was quite a difficult birth, so pray for Carla as she recovers and heals from that. Um, Anne Lewis, so some of us um, will have known Anne Lewis. Anne Lewis was part of the congregation online for the last couple of years. Anne and her family moved to Port Albert at the beginning of lockdown. Unfortunately, Anne passed away on Monday. Um, she loved Jesus, and so we can praise God that she's safe with him now. Um, but we must remember in prayer her family, so Dave, her husband, and her children, Anne and John, um, that many of you will have known um, as they've been coming regularly over the last year or so. Um, so please keep that family in your prayers. Uh, if you are doing the theology course, it would usually be tonight, but that will be next Sunday instead. So don't come tonight, come next week instead for the theology course. If you would like to give um, by tithing into the collection, we don't normally do a collection when we pass it round. Instead, there's a box at the back on the door or next to the door. It's white. I can't see it from here, but there is a box next to the door. Um, and you're welcome to put anything for the collection in that box. Or if you'd like to give by direct debit, you can see Julie Wood, um, who can give you a form to fill out, um, and we can get that set up for you. Um, I've got another note here from John Buckley. Bless him. I've got a script from John. Uh, thank you, John. <laughs> so I'll just read that for you. Uh, this is about the practical care. So at the moment, Gwyneth Singh um, heads up and coordinates the practical care ministry here, and she's looking to update the records of people who are able to help and volunteer some time um, into that ministry. So if you feel that you are able to serve God and the church family in any way, so things like um, providing meals for people, um, giving lifts to the hospital, or anything like that, if you feel that that's something that you'd like to do and that's something that you can do, um, could you find Gwyneth or John after the service and they'll get a form completed from you um, and get you up to date with how that ministry works. And finally, uh, John is leading today. Neil, I believe, is preaching. Um, babies and comp group will leave in the third song. Cheers, Hans. We stand together. And as we're standing, I'm just going to read a portion of Isaiah 43, which says this, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I just want to encourage us this morning. 
you may, I, I have no idea how you've come in here today, but let's focus on Jesus. Let's focus on what he's done. Let's focus on the fact that he created the whole world. Everything that we see, he's created, but yet he stepped down onto this earth, lived a sinless life, and died a sinner's death on that cross. So three days later, for that grave to be empty, to be risen again, and to have sin, conquered sin, death, and hell. That should stir you up this morning, church. It stirs me up. That's where we're at. Should we pray together? Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that, God, that you first, you saved us, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, all, for the cross, God. Thank you, Lord, that it, we, were, we were stuck. There was nothing that we could have done, Lord, but yet you stepped down and you made a way, God. You made that way so we can be with you, that we can, we can know you as Savior, God, that we can now, when we depart this life, spend eternity praising and loving you. God, thank you for that, God. Thank you, God, for where we are. Thank you, God, that if we're Christians right now, that you are with us, God, that you are meeting with us here, God. Thank you, God, for the hope that we have in you, regardless of what's in and around us, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, God, we can all say that we have this hope in Jesus that, that, that can never go. He is so faithful. So help us, God, to respond to these incredible truths this morning, God, regardless of the week we've just had, if it's been a good week with you or a bad week with you, God, I just pray that we can spend this small moment in time here now just to, just to, just to get right with you again. God, to know that you are incredible. As our, that song we used to sing here goes, awestruck, we fall to our knees and humbly proclaim that you are an amazing God. God, forgive us today, God, if we've come into this place and not even given you a moment's thought all week. But right now, God, right here, God, I just, we, we just pray and we lift you up and we say, God, we're sorry for that, God, but equally, we thank you, God, that it's not down to us, God, it's all you. It's all your grace. God, we are just sinners saved by grace. What a hope we have in Jesus. Should we respond together, church?
Lord, that nothing can separate us from you anymore. God, if we're in you this morning, nothing can separate us. Help us to celebrate in that, God. Help us to live every single day for you. God, help us, help us now, God, as we move on with the service, that you meet, that you speak in power in your precious name. Amen. Please take your seats. Hello, uh, good morning everybody. Um, my name is Liz, Liz Coston, and I've been in our church now for nearly three years. You know my husband, Craig, and I've been helping Neil with work on mission because I'm sure we all agree mission is a really important part of church life and as a church we are supporting seven missions. Every month we give missions money to help support the work they do and the seven missions are actually on the board at the back of the church in the yellow and green card. So over the last few months, we've heard about CAP, which Hannah Tamale, um is very much involved in. We've heard from um, about uh, Dr. Mikey, and we've also heard from Di Hankey, who came to preach a few months ago, very passionately, in his church in Cardiff. And they are three out of our seven missions that the church supports. And in order that the church is, the church is properly supporting the missions, every house group has been given a mission to support. So the idea is that every house group prays regularly for that mission to ensure those people are getting the support that they need. And today, I'd like to share the mission that my house group, that James Vile leads, is supporting. And the, ch the mission that we support is Tim and Jess Steele. That's a picture of them there. And they used to be members of this church. I never met them when they were here, but I think they left... We couldn't work it out, could we? I think we said about five, six -ish years ago. So some of you, I think, know Jess and Tim. And I believe they come back kind of every year, and, and some of you would have met them. Some of you wouldn't have. Some of you would have. Um, and they, have, they now live in Birmingham. And they work in a centre called the Friendship Centre. There it is. And this centre is all about working with the Islamic community. And their outreach is all about supporting families in Birmingham who are Islamic. And at the moment, they have about 50 to 60 people every week visiting the centre. And at the centre, they have English language lessons, they have children's clubs, things like football, after-school clubs. Um, they have about 12 volunteers working for them. And every day, the guys go there to work with the community. Um, so it's amazing work that they are doing, um, obviously quite hard work, and obviously over the last couple of years it's been quite difficult with COVID, but they've now got their volunteers and things are moving in the right direction. And um, they've said, they've told us that they have had some really good opportunities over Easter to spread the gospel, because that's what they want to do, as well as practically supporting the people in the community, they obviously want to spread the gospel. So... Um, we would like to pray for them in a minute, and they're asking prayer for boldness, boldness and eyes to be opened. So I'll pray for that in a minute. But also, they want our help at some point very soon. They're asking some help from the church to help them decorate the centre. So um, at some point over the next few months, we are hoping to send the minibus up to Birmingham with people from our church to help them decorate and also to do some prayer walking and to support some of their clubs. And Jess and Tim are really keen to have help from Baglin. We haven't got a date yet, but when we do have a date, we'll be letting you know in good time. It'll be an overnight stay in a hotel, we suspect. Um, but time to go and really practically help a mission that's sent out from this church. So we'll let you know as soon as we do the date that we have in plan for that. Okay. So Jess and Tim Steele doing a wonderful job in Birmingham. I'd like to pray for them now if that's okay and please have a look at the boards so you'll know who the seven missions are. Neil and I are very keen to bring mission regularly to church so over the next few months you'll be hearing more about the other missions that we are supporting as a church. So if we could pray for Jess and Tim please. 
Uh, dear Father, we really thank you for Jess and Tim Steele and their family. We thank you for calling them to the work in Birmingham. We really pray you will be with them in everything they do. We pray for boldness to share about you. We pray for eyes to be open. We pray for energy and enthusiasm. We pray for volunteers to keep working there. And we pray for all of the people who are going there on a daily basis. We just pray they'll hear about you and your love. Amen. Should we stand together, guys? One of my favorite hymns, I love this one. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and clean. I just love this hymn. Should we stand? Should we, should we sing it out?
Father, thank you. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you, God, that, for your living hope. Thank you, God, that we are victorious in you. So, God, as we come to your word, now just pray that you speak in power. In your name, amen. Thanks, guys. Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you. We're in the book of Exodus uh, still today. Uh, so, the book of Exodus is about the people of God being rescued from Egypt, out of slavery, the Exodus. Um, and then they're in the wilderness. God makes a covenant with his people at Mount Sinai, the commandments, Ten Commandments. Um, and last week, we saw the tabernacle, which is then God establishing his presence with his people, but showing his people how you actually approach him. We saw that last week. This week, we're looking at the priesthood. So last week is, how do you approach God? This week, who's the person who helps us approach God? The priest, that's what we're looking at this week, in a nutshell. Okay, we're going to go pretty fast. There's so much to get through. Again, three more chapters. We're not going to be able to do it all. We're not going to be able to look at the entire priesthood and what it's all about. Um, but the important things, the salient points, hopefully, that you'll find helpful. Let me show you a picture of a priest. Um, headless priest, I guess. Um, so that may look a weeny bit odd to you and I. So like when we're thinking of really kind of elaborate swish clothing, we would think, I don't know, Vivian Westwood, Versace, whatever. But in those days, that would have been, the, I guess, the business. We, we'll see that in a minute now. Let me just point out a couple of things. So the, the kind of the undergarment was the robe. That's the, the blue uh, garment there. Then um, this kind of stripy garment that looks like a tabard. That's important. That's the ephod. Okay, we'll come back to that. And then that sort of square section uh, on the chest there is the breastplate. And, and we're going to come back to the breast piece, okay? We're going to come back to that a bit later. That's really important as well. Right, let's move into the text. This is Exodus chapter 28 and verse 1. Okay, have Aaron, your brother, brought to you from among the Israelites, along with the sons uh, Nadab and Abihu, Eliza and Eliezer, rather, and Ithamar, so they may serve me as priests. Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. So that's what those garments are about, to give the person wearing them real dignity and honor. And as we'll see as we go along, the priesthood was pointing towards Jesus and the perfection of Jesus, and the beauty of Jesus, and the, the righteousness of Jesus. So these garments were meant to convey real high dignity and honor. Verse 3, tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters, that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration, so he may serve me as priest. So it was about consecrating them, setting them apart, um, to serve and to worship God. Now, we're all meant to aim for complete consecration being set apart to God, but the one person who achieved perfect consecration, obedience to God, of course, was Jesus Christ. Verse 9, skipping a few verses. Take two onyx stones. Remember last week, we just uh, drew attention to the fact that there were onyx stones in the, in the tabernacle because they were onyx stones also in the Garden of Eden. So this is God communicating. He's bringing people back to himself, to Eden, restored. So take two onyx stones and engrave them on the names of the sons of Israel. This is talking about ephod, by the way. I haven't mentioned that. So this is on the ephod. Um, uh, in the order of their birth, six names on one stone and the remaining six on the other. So these are the, the tribes of Israel. Six on one shoulder on stone on the ephod, and six on the other, all the people of God represented by the priest. Engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones, uh, the way a gem cutter engraves a seal, then mount the stones in gold filigree settings. Filigree is kind of um, a very sort of delicate, detailed molding. And then fasten them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones, for the sons of Israel, Aaron is to bear the names on his shoulders as a memorial before the Lord. And so he bears the, the children of Israel. He represents all of God's people. He wears them on his shoulders as a memorial before God. 
In other words, to remind God of his people and what God does for his people. Now, you may be saying, now, we, we don't need to remind God, do we? There's not a case of like, so the priest goes in every day and, and he stands before God and God sees the stones and the name is like, oh, yeah, I keep forgetting my people. It's not that he would ever forget us. So what's the purpose of this memorial before God? It's for us, isn't it? It's to speak to us and to tell us that, do you know, every single day without fail, God remembers us. God doesn't forget us. It feels like he does sometimes, I guess, doesn't it? Do you know when things cloud over in our lives? Cloud as in like a day like this, where you look up at the sky, it's complete cloud cover, and the sun has disappeared. So we don't see the light of the sun. We don't feel the warmth of the sun. We feel miserable and low because everything feels dark. That can be life sometimes, can't it? What conclusion do we draw about the sun? We don't conclude that because we can't see the sun, that it's, it's actually done a runner, and it's gone off to a distant galaxy, and it's gone away. We know the sun is still there. And we know the sun will shine when the clouds will break one day. We know that, don't we? Isn't that life, guys? Isn't that life where sometimes it can feel so dark and so dreary, and it can feel sometimes that God isn't here, and God has disappeared, and God has forgotten about us. But he hasn't forgotten about us. He never forgets about us every single day. He remembers us and cares about us and loves us. And we need to remember that like the sun, he's there. And you know, when we think about it and when we remember by faith that he is there and he loves us, often it's at that time that those, those rays of light of the sun of his greatness and his glory shine through again on our lives. Let's read on. Uh, let's jump to verse 15. Uh, we're talking about the breast piece now. So that's the ephod, two stones on the shoulder. Breast piece. Um, fashion a breast piece, breastplate, for making decisions. We'll come back to that a bit later, why it's a, for making decisions. The work of skilled hands. Make it like the ephod of gold and a blue, purple and scarlet yarn and a finely twisted linen. It is to be square, a span long and a span wide, and folded double. A span is half a cubit. Remember last week I said a cubit is the length from your elbow to the tip of your middle finger, roughly 44 centimeters. Uh, uh, a span, half of that, roughly 22, nine inches or so. Um, verse 17, then mount four rows of precious stones on it. The first row shall be carnelian, chrysolite, and beryl. The second row, uh, turquoise, Lapis, lazuli, and emerald, and the third row shall be uh, jacinth or jacinth, agate or agate, and amethyst. The fourth row shall be topaz, onyx, again onyx, and jasper. Mount them in gold filigree settings. There are to be 12 stones, one for each of the names of the sons of Israel, each engraved like a seal with the name of one of the 12 tribes. And whenever, jump into verse 29 now, whenever Aaron enters the holy place, so he's wearing all these robes, he's wearing this ephod with the names on the shoulders, and he's wearing this breastpiece with the 12 names of the tribes of Israel represented there. Listen to what it says. When Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel over his heart on the breastpiece of decision as a continuing memorial before God, before the Lord. What's he saying there? What's being communicated there? The high priest not only represents the people, but he represents them with love. He wears them over his heart. He has compassion on his people. God is communicating to his people, and in some way, and we'll see in what way a bit later, that he absolutely loves his people. Daily, he loves his people. Verse 30. Also put the Urim and the Thummim, or Thummim, in the breastpiece so they may be over Aaron's heart whenever he enters the presence of the Lord. There, thus, Aaron will always bear the names of making decisions for the Israelites over his heart before the Lord. Have you ever heard of the Urim and the Thummim? <laughs> and do you know what the Urim and the Thummim are? You may have heard of them, you may not know what they are. Basically, it was a means of knowing what God wanted them to do which is why it was called the breast piece of decision. Nobody knows what the Urim and the Thummim were. They could have been two items, like two stones. 
or two, two sticks. There could have been several. The Urim could have been a few things. The Thummim could have been a few things. We really don't know. Nobody knows. But people's best guess is that they were probably either two sticks or two stones, maybe like one black stone, one white stone. And they would use those to decide, or rather, for God to communicate through what they should do. Lord, should we go to war and we are trusting you to guide us now supernaturally, and they would take the Urim and the Thummim, and they would, I don't know, whatever they would do, roll them, or whatever, kind of like tossing a coin or whatever. Heads, we go to war. Tails, we don't go to war. But we believe that God is behind this process. That's kind of what they did back then, which sounds a bit strange to us, doesn't it? Now, as, as you go through the Old Testament, and as the prophets then enter, you find that they use the Urim and the Thummim less because God is speaking now through people to his people, through the prophets. There's one mention in the book of Ezra, but then that's it for the rest of the Bible. When you get to the New Testament, you may, you may remember that when they chose a, a disciple to replace Judas, they cast lots. And you may have thought, well, that's an unusual thing to do. But then when the Holy Spirit came and after that, you see the way in which the people of God are led are through the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. And so that's how you and I, in terms of the normative practice of God, should be led by God through the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. What you should never do is, shall I marry this person? Heads, I do. Tails, don't ever do that. <laughs> or should I take this job? Heads, don't, okay? Uh, God doesn't lead that way. I don't think normally an anymore. So that's verse 30 of that chapter. Let's move on to verse 42. Um, make linen undergarments as a covering for the body, reaching from the waist to the thigh. Aaron and his sons must wear them whenever they enter the tent of meeting or approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they will not incur guilt and die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants. So this is to do with the undergarments that they were wearing now. now. But it applied to all the garments in that they needed specifically to wear what God wanted them to wear as a representation of their appropriateness, their rightness, their righteousness before God. If they didn't wear those exact clothes, then God would hold them guilty for not wearing the right clothes. And we'll see how this points actually to the, the incredible righteousness of Christ and the robes of righteousness that we have. Chapter 29. It's a whistle-stop tour. Chapter 29, verse 10. Bring the bull. So this is about how now um, the priests, Aaron and his sons, are going to be made right in order to be priests before God and to represent the people. Uh, bring a bull to the front of the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on its head. Bull, they were putting their hands on their head. Slaughter this bull then in the Lord's presence at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Verse 15, take one of the rams, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on its head. Slaughter it and take the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar. Verse 19, take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on its head, slaughter it, take some of its blood, and put it on the lobes of the right ears of Aaron and his sons, on the thumbs of their right hands, and their big toes, and their right feet, then splash the blood against the sides of the altar. What are they doing there? Well, can you see there's something about transmission there, isn't it? So they are laying their hands on this animal representative of their sin, being transmitted, as it were, to this animal that would then die in their place for the guilt of their sin. And this is what it says then in verse 21, and take some blood from the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it then on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on their garments, and then he and his sons and their garments will be consecrated. So it's another picture of the cross, isn't it? We come to the cross, we give Jesus, as it were, our sin, like laying our sin at the cross. And what Jesus does in reply then in return, so that goes to Jesus, our sin, what comes back to us is the blood of Christ, the cleansing of Christ, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's salvation. Have you given your sin to Jesus Christ? Are you aware that you've done that, that you come to Jesus and you said, Jesus, I need forgiveness and you are the one who can take my sin. I give my sin, all of it, Jesus, to you 
Will you in return cleanse me, make me righteous, and give me your Holy Spirit? Have you done that yet? Let's move on to chapter 30 now. One more thing. I want to, there's sort of other things, lots of things here. I just want to bring you a few things today. This is chapter 30, verse 30 to 33. So chapter 30, verses 30 to 33. Uh, anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so that they may serve me as priests. Say to the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. Do not pour it on anyone else's body and do not make any other oil using the same formula. It is sacred and you are to consider it sacred. Whoever makes perfume like it and puts it on anyone other than a priest must be cut off from their people. That's interesting, isn't it? So they would, they would anoint um, the, the priests with a special formula of oil. And that formula, those ingredients that made up that oil, had to be used for the priests and in no other situation whatsoever because God was communicating, not that there was something, you know, like... Um, that was in, 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 in some ways magical about that particular formula. But he's saying that what I'm pointing you to is this is special. And this is representative of something really sacred and really important. You were being anointed, sealed, set apart, uh, set in mission on task for a specific purpose. And this is a representation of the Holy Spirit here. So that's why it was so important. Okay, this is top two of the priesthood. Let me make three points, uh, which will show the relevance of the priesthood to you and I and how it points to Jesus and what that means for our lives ongoing now. Point number one, we have a great high priest. We have a great high priest. So when you look back at the Old Testament, you see the people had priests that represented them. You and I, we have the great high priest, as the Bible describes him. Uh, there's a, a book in the Bible called the book of Hebrews, which really explains to New Testament believers the purpose of the priesthood and the purpose of the tabernacle and shows how it all pointed to Jesus. It's the book of Hebrews. Let me just take you to a few verses in Hebrews. This is Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 to 2. Now, the main point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. So last week, we looked at the tabernacle, which is made by human hands, which is representative of the people being brought in by the priest through the altar, then into the holy place, and then into the most holy place through the curtain in order to get into the presence of God and be in a relationship with God. That was a pattern, a pattern ultimately of heaven, the true tabernacle where God dwells and that Jesus takes us to. So if we look at um, chapter 10, and verse 19, chapter 10, verses 19 to 20 now. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain, remember the curtain before the uh, most holy place, the holy of holies, that is his body. And so what he's saying there is by Christ dying on the cross, his body being broken was like that curtain being torn and given us access into that holy of holies, into heaven itself, which is where Jesus has gone. So priests on earth go into this holy place on earth, in the tabernacle. Jesus has gone into the true tabernacle made by God, heaven itself. And then one more section of Hebrews. This is Hebrews now, chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. Listen carefully to what he says. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence 
so we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Jesus is our great high priest who has ascended to heaven and who stands before God for you and me today and every day. Now, you need to go back to the picture of the high priest in your, in your minds, and you need to understand that, remember the high priest and how he represented the people in the Old Testament. And how has he represented the people? He had on his breastplate there all the names of the tribes of Israel in precious jewels close to his what? Heart. To show his love and his compassion for the people he represented. Jesus stands in heaven today with your name close to his heart, representing you before God, loving you before God. You know, as we, as we go through life, and as we, we think about our salvation, and we think about the security of our salvation and so on, um, is the security of our salvation dependent on how often we get to church? No, it's not, is it? Is, is the security of our salvation dependent on how good we are? No, it's not, is it? Is the security of our salvation dependent on how, what about being faithful to God? No, it's not, is it? Is the security of our salvation dependent on not really sinning really, really badly all the time, constantly? No, it's not. Do you know there'll be times in your life where you'll be thinking, I don't, I don't really know if I'm secure in my salvation. I don't really know if God loves me anymore because I do not deserve it. Where's the security of your salvation? Where does it lie? Let me tell you where it lies. In heaven. Because in heaven, Christ has gone there and he has your name, not on earth, but in heaven. He wears it close to his heart. He loves you. And so long as Christ is in heaven, nobody will be able to say to you, well, then move away. Get out of heaven. You've lost your... As long as Christ is in heaven and he has your name on his heart, you are secure in your salvation in Christ Jesus. He loves you. You know when he died for you and I on the cross, and you think that was just an incredible, amazing love the love that took Jesus to the cross, the love that made him suffer incredible pain and torment, suffering alone for you and for me. What incredible love at the cross. Did that love stop at the cross? Was that the climax of God's love, of Jesus' love for us? And after that, it's like it's not anywhere near anymore. No, he loves you now, today, as much as he did when he died for you as a sinner on the cross. Today, Tomorrow, with an intense, passionate, perfect love. The day after, with an intense, passionate, perfect love. Can you see him there in heaven, your name close to his heart, saying to you today, I love you, and I'm never going to let you go. And not just that as well. When you think about um, what Christ Jesus has done on the cross and the 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 heart he displays for us and the love he displays for us. Listen to what um, Dane Ortland says in his book, uh, Gentle and Lowly. He says this, you know, rather than dispensing grace to us from on high, he gets down with us, he puts his arm around us, and he deals with us in the way that is just what we need. We don't have a high priest, it says, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. I guess in one sense, before Jesus came, we could say, God, what do you know about what it's like to be human? What do you know what it's like to, to suffer the degree of temptation that we suffer? What do you know about it's like to be human and to suffer the pain and the torment and the difficulties of being human? The incredible thing is Christ Jesus didn't come into our mess just to rescue us out of our mess. He came into our mess to understand what it's like to be in our mess. So we can say to you and I, I get it, I understand I know exactly how awful, severe temptation is. I understand. I get it. I understand what it's like to be left. I get it. I understand what it's like to be mistreated, to be treated unfairly, to suffer pain. I get it. I understand. I care about you. We have an amazing, great high priest. 
Secondly, we are clothed in robes of righteousness. We are clothed in robes of righteousness. So we were thinking about the priests earlier on, and then we, we know that the priest was representative of Jesus, who was perfect righteousness. And we know, don't we, that when we come to Jesus Christ, he gives us his righteousness. Let's think about that for a minute now. Isaiah 16, 61 verse 10 says this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. That's, that's us. We are dressed in a robe of righteousness. Now think back to the priest again. And think back to how spectacularly decked out the priest was. And what did God want to communicate by the clothes that the priest was wearing? We read the phrase, dignity and honor. Dignity and honor. Now, I want you to think about this for yourselves now. Not on the outside. We're talking about our moral standing before God. And what we need to appreciate is when God looks at us now, we are decked out in the priestly robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so when he sees us, he sees dignity and honor. That's what he sees when he sees our robe of righteousness. You know, what you and I tend to do is we come to Jesus Christ, don't we? And we, and we come knowing that we, we come with nothing and we need to be saved as we are and he makes us right. And as we go through a Christian life sometimes, then we almost imagine that we have to kind of dress ourselves up. And so what we do is that we, we feel that we need to perform for God. We feel that we need to be a particular way. We need to be good. We need to be going to church, whatever it is, in order for God to look at us and see us and be happy with the way we look. So what we're doing morally, we're dressing ourselves. Here I am, God, this is what I've got on today. And what is it? Filthy rags. And sometimes that we can convince ourselves, God must think I look great today, and then we look at ourselves and we're like, oh man, I'm stinking, I'm disgusting, I'm awful. And when we really do analyze ourselves and think about our lives, what are we? We're stinking, disgusting, we're awful, we're filthy rags when we dress ourselves. But we don't need to dress ourselves, do we, morally? Because God says we are decked out in the righteousness of Christ. And so you may think in your head, I need to dress myself today. You don't. You're already dressed out like Jesus. You already have the robe of righteousness on you. You have dignity and honor before God because of that incredible robe of righteousness. And then thirdly, and finally, we are anointed. We're anointed. You know, we talked about the anointing just a short while ago, didn't we? And the fact that when Aaron went into the, uh, the tabernacle, he had to have oil placed on him. So he was sealed with this special sacred oil. It would have been kind of either sort of uh, smeared on his forehead or or poured on his forehead and dripping down. And that was what they did throughout the Old Testament for the prophets and the priests and the kings. So it talks about Samuel going to this young boy, David, and anointing him with oil as king. And you know, from that point on, the Bible says the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, rested on him. The Spirit of God rests on you when you are anointed and then Jesus came into the world as the Messiah. Do you know what the Messiah means? What the word Messiah means? Means anointed one. Do you know what Christ means? The Greek alternative means anointed one. And so Christ was anointed, sealed, set apart by God with the Holy Spirit for the task of being the Savior of the world. So he had this incredible anointing. But do you know that you are similarly anointed by the Holy Spirit? 
Let me take you to a couple of verses. Um, first of all, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, and then we're going to move to 1 John. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 says this. And now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And now look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 and verse 27. Verse 20, first of all, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Because you have an anointing, you know the truth. Verse 27, uh, as for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. So it talks about us having received something, an anointing, the Holy Spirit, the seal that guarantees our salvation in him, but also gives us an ability to have knowledge, to have revelation from God, kind of like the prophets of the Old Testament, where they received God's word, God spoke to them, in a similar way, you and I are given an anointing to be able to understand, first of all, the gospel, to be able to understand who Jesus is, to be able to understand and see our sin, to be able to understand who God is and how he works. Let's not undervalue and underappreciate what we have. Do you know what I think sometimes is, because it's all spiritual, we don't see this, there's almost some value sometimes in kind of you know this acting out of the priesthood and where before they went in, they were dressed up and so they knew what they were doing was really, really important. And then they, there was this oil, this special oil that God said, this is sacred now, this is really important. And they put it on their forehead and they would have felt this sense of something is being done to me now that is really, really, really important. Do you know that when you got saved, something was done to you that was really, really important. You didn't see it. You didn't maybe feel it on your forehead. But God did this incredible work in you in giving you his Holy Spirit and giving you an incredible anointing to understand and to hear from God. You've almost got to imagine God having taken the, this oil, if you like, and placed it on your forehead. And that oil representing the Holy Spirit who is now in you and anointing you, setting you apart for the incredible position and privilege and power of receiving God's word. The people in this world don't have, but you have because you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit. You know, you read a couple of times in the book of Revelation as well that we're a kingdom and a priesthood to God to reign on the earth. And so in the same way that the priests were anointed to have this special function of not just representing the people, but coming in and being in the presence of God and worshiping him, you and I have an anointing, a privilege a responsibility, a position to be worshippers of God. You see that? That's our, that's our position. We don't just come in and this is what we do because we're Christians and we enjoy it. No, this is our anointing to have this position to be a worshipper of God, to serve God in his presence. And we will reign with Jesus with his kingly authority as well. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is mine, therefore you go. And so we have been given this anointing, not for our own power, not for our own sakes, not for our own glory, not for our own mission, but for Jesus. Do you realize that? Do you realize that we have the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, so God can actually use you and I? God can actually change lives through you and I, not about us. I'm not saying that. I don't want to build you up. I don't want to make, make us think it's about us. It's not at all. But God wants to use you and I. 
And so it's really important that we understand that He can use you and I, and that He's given us the anointing of the Holy Spirit in order to use you and I. Jesus is our incredible high priest. Let me just recap from back to front. We have an anointing. We are anointed. We are clothed in robes of righteousness, and we have Jesus as our great high priest. Listen to these words of this song that we're about to sing. Before the throne of God above, think up now, look up. I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue could bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair, and he tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and I see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. So behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect, spotless righteousness. The great and changeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One with himself, I can't die. My sinful soul, my soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hidden with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. Shall we pray together? Oh, Father God, thank you so much for Jesus. We know the whole scripture points to Jesus. And thank you that this communicates to us his ongoing love for us, the security of our salvation, the the way in which you've presented us now to yourself, Father, with dignity and honor, and the anointing that you've given us, the privilege of being set apart with the seal of the Holy Spirit in us. Father God, we we ask you, will you help us to understand and appreciate the enormity of what that means for us, how special that makes us in Christ, how amazing Jesus is. Will you remind us constantly? Will you remind us to, to constantly hold firm, as you say, hold firm to what we know is true, And when we are struggling, when we are feeling condemned, when we are feeling guilty, to look up and see him there who made an end to all my sin and who holds my name graven on his hands, written on his heart. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for everything you are to us. We pray for your glory. Amen. we stand and respond together. Oh
for us through the curtain that is his body and since you have a great priest over the house of God let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, profess for he who promised is faithful let me repeat that last bit. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Oh God, we thank you for your word that you brought us this morning. Thank you, God, that you, you keep us close to your heart, that our names are graven on your heart. God, that we know our future if we're in Christ here this morning. It's with you for eternity. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And I pray, God, if there's anyone who do, does not know you this morning, then turn them to you now. God, may they see you for the very first time. And that joy that we've been speaking about this morning, knowing that one, one time in our lives we were messed up and sin, and just you saw us just sinners, but now you see us as saints in you. God, it's an incredible. It's incredible. God, I just pray this morning, God, that you they will save I pray this morning, God, that as church Christians, if we've gone stale and stagnant, God, then I pray that you stir our hearts through your spirit here this morning, God, that we leave this place in love with you, that we leave this place in wanting to serve you, wanting to walk with you, wanting to learn more about you. But God, we thank you, God, for the faithful preaching of your word here. God, I pray that you, you continue to bless us, God, as we, as we learn more and more and more about you. In your precious name. Amen. Please take your seats. <clears throat> 